Cambridge University graduation day. Another group of brilliant, beautiful, talented young people prepare to go out into the world, there to achieve fame, wealth and power. The sight of them might fill us with joy. Alternatively, as they file through the courtyards of their ancient colleges to receive their degrees, something about their achievements and their prospects might lead us to a debilitating sense that we're not as bright as we should be, nor as rich, beautiful, talented and successful. Their behaviour on their special day might, quite unintentionally, serve to depress us. If we're struck by such feelings of inadequacy, there is one philosopher to whom we should turn. His name is Michel de Montaigne. Michel de Montaigne was really the most unusual and lovable of philosophers, and I think for one reason in particular. He seems to understand what makes us feel bad about ourselves, and in his book tries to make us feel better. I think he covers about three main areas of what one could call inadequacy. Firstly, a kind of bodily inadequacy, the sense that we aren't comfortable with our bodies, that we feel awkward about them. Secondly, the inadequacy that we might feel when we feel that others are judging us, that our customs and habits are being disapproved of. And thirdly, intellectual inadequacy, the feeling that we're just not as clever as we should be. And for all these three areas, Montaigne came up with highly practical, simple, and I think very helpful solutions. At the summit of a wooded hill in the heart of rural France, some 30 miles east of Bordeaux, stands a handsome castle with views onto oak forests and hay fields. In the 16th century, it was Michel de Montaigne's home. Montaigne was born in 1533, and from the outside, his class and achievements might seem more likely to intimidate us than rescue us from a sense of inadequacy. He was a nobleman, a lawyer, a friend of the King of France, and twice mayor of Bordeaux. But at the age of 38, Montaigne decided to retire to his castle to spend the rest of his life here, reading, reflecting and writing. At first he didn't know what to write about, but he gradually hit upon a revolutionary idea, to write a big book on a subject he was uniquely placed to understand, himself. He set out to tell us exactly what it was like to be Michel de Montaigne. When one hears that Montaigne lived in a castle like this, and that he was the mayor of Bordeaux for two terms, and that he's a philosopher, uh, one might come across uh, certain sort of prejudices. Uh, one might imagine um, s the kind of man he was, the kind of things that we'll find uh, in his book. But I think what's remarkable, and for me deeply moving and charming about his work, his most famous work, The Essays, uh, is that actually its contents are nothing like uh, the typical philosophy book um, that Montaigne wanted in this book to, as it were, redraw the whole portrait that we have of what human beings are. Most books didn't seem to Montaigne to really reflect human experience. They edited out all sorts of aspects. What Montaigne wanted to do was to bring these aspects back in, which is why he spends an awful lot of time uh, in his work talking about the kinds of things that most philosophy books leave out. For instance, the penis. Um, he tells us that he wants to talk a lot about his penis. He says, every one of my members, each as much as another, makes me myself, and none makes me more properly a man than that one. I owe to the public my portrait complete. And it was Montaigne's goal in his essays to insert into uh, our, our normal conception of what a human being is, all these aspects that are actually a part of our reality, but never get mentioned in philosophy books. Montaigne thought we were surrounded by the wrong role models. They don't give space to what most of us are actually like, and this can lead us to self-hatred when we fail to make the grade. Which is why Montaigne spent much time in his book telling us ordinary, everyday things about himself, to encourage us to accept the ordinary in ourselves. It's why he tells us, for example, about his bowel movements, and that he eats so fast he often bites his fingers. Trivia, perhaps, but a reminder that there are many humdrum, but nevertheless acceptable sides to human nature. As he wrote, the most terrible and violent of our afflictions is to despise our own beings. Because Montaigne confides in us so much, tells us things we don't normally hear about, like impotence or farting, it's easy to feel him becoming a friend, someone far from the austere, starched image of a philosopher. And as one might visit a friend, I was drawn to visit his chateau, further to foster the sense of almost personal relationship I'd formed with him. 
Mortain worked in a tower at one end of his castle. On the ground floor was a chapel. He had the acoustics organized so that he could hear mass being sung as he lay in bed upstairs. It's moving to come here and to see how unchanged it all is. Here is the very tower which Montaigne was describing in his book hundreds of years ago. It reinforces the sense of personal identification that readers of his essays tend to have. Montaigne loved the sensation of falling asleep, so much so that he'd have the bells of his castle rung in the middle of the night to wake him, so as to have the pleasure of drifting back to sleep. But it was really the top of the tower I'd come to see, for there Montaigne had his study, which he loved and described in detail. It's the perfect place for a bookish man. There used to be a collection of a thousand books arranged in a semicircle around the walls. There was room to pace. The best thoughts came to him that way, he said, and views onto the gardens. But though this might look like a perfect haven for a remote intellectual, Montaigne remained extraordinarily down to earth. Much of what he tells us has an almost homespun quality to it. So if we believe it, it's because we trust Montaigne as a friend, a man with the courage to speak the great truths with simplicity and with honesty. Montaigne was a highly unusual philosopher, and in one respect particularly. Most philosophers up until Montaigne had pointed out that having a mind can lead us to happiness, that it's reason which gives us the best chance of fulfillment. Montaigne turned that equation on its head and built a philosophy out of pointing out the extent to which we have problems precisely because we have reason, because we have minds. And the first problem with having a mind, Montaigne thought, is that it makes for awkward relations with our bodies. Unlike other animals, we're often disgusted by our physical selves. We think we're too fat or gross or uncouth. We develop eating disorders, sexual hang-ups and embarrassments. Montaigne observed many people around him, afflicted by physical shame. He knew a man who killed himself after letting out a cacophony of farts at a banquet. He met a woman who was so embarrassed to chew in public that she always ate behind a curtain. And another man he knew ordered that he be buried in his underpants for fear that anyone should ever see his penis. He ought to have remembered to blindfold the undertakers, added Montaigne. Montaigne knew what the problem was. It's because the body is so rarely mentioned in polite company, let alone in philosophy books, that we think of it as embarrassing and shameful. He urged us to accept as an in no way awkward fact that we are half animal. We have to see how much we have in common with the creatures of the farmyard. Kings and philosophers shit, he reminded us, and so do ladies. Montaigne's chateau was of course a working farm, so he had plenty of opportunity uh, to look at animals. And Montaigne came away from his observation of animals uh, with an interesting point. He said, they often surpass us in wisdom. He believed that animals are in many ways far cleverer than we are. For example, animals are far more natural with their bodies than we are. Uh, they don't have many of the embarrassments, the shynesses, the, the shames that we have. They have a much more natural relationship. And what's particularly striking is that here, towards the end of the 16th century, is a philosopher who's saying animals are in many ways our equals. And this is an extremely striking thing to say, and I think a very touching thing to say. Montaigne was very endeared by them, placed them at the centre of his philosophy, saw them as exemplars of a kind of wisdom which he believed we should imitate. Montaigne wasn't reminding us of our place in the farmyard to degrade us, rather to help us to grow more acceptable to ourselves. We should accept our bodies with good grace and a touch of humour, as naturally as animals do. It's a simple thought, but there's no reason why things should be complicated in order to be true. And it's only the first of many blunt but helpful truths this most down-to-earth of philosophers has to teach us. Having a big brain isn't just a problem, Montaigne thought, because it leads us to feel ashamed of our bodies. It's also a very big problem because it leads us to feel arrogant, to think that we know what's right and to impose that vision on other people. 
Every society has its ideas about what is normal, what it's normal to eat or wear or say. And if you stray from these in some way, you're quickly liable to come up against all sorts of narrow-mindedness and prejudice, to be accused of being weird and made fun of, or worse. Imagine, for example, that your favourite foods don't tend to crop up on the typical British menu. Hello, can I just sit down for a second? Yes. Well, what do you think of, of eating something a bit, a bit sort of different? Like, um, we've got some food from around the world here. That's, um, that's a wonderful goat's head. Um, they tend to eat that in the Caribbean. And that's some uh, pig snail, which is very beautiful. That is, um, that's from South America. And here we've got some um, chicken feet that are from China. <laughs> no, thank you. Really. Do you, do you think that's something that you might like I'm to have? I'm vegetarian, so... You're vegetarian, <laughs> right. And we've got some... Things here that don't often appear on the menu. Of course, we all divide the world up into the normal and the abnormal. It doesn't look appealing. I'm much too conservative. It's not, not normally on the menu. It doesn't much matter when just pub food is at stake. I mean, that's what you'd have, you know, for Sunday lunch or. But Montaigne had graphic evidence to hand of how people sometimes behave towards those who don't share their customs. Some 40 years before Montaigne's birth, Columbus sailed to the New World. Montaigne had these very pictures to look at to show him how the Spanish colonists behaved towards those who they found there. They slaughtered the natives in enormous numbers. During Montaigne's own lifetime, the numbers of native South Americans dropped from 80 to 10 million. Unusually for a European of his day, Montaigne was appalled by the colonists and identified wholly with the Indians but he argued that the intolerance the conquistadors had shown was everywhere. People constantly rashly decide what is normal and what is abnormal and persecute those who don't fit. The prejudice the Indians had encountered we are all liable to face in far less catastrophic ways the day we stray from the customs of our own countries. So, what should we do if we encounter the prejudices of others? In a word, go travelling, either in reality or in our minds. We should go out and greet the diversity of the world. Hello. And that way we'll see that what one society judges to be weird, another society might more fairly judge to be normal. ¿Qué tal? Every country has its prejudices. Chora. But travel between countries loosens the grip of any one prejudice. It's not just that travel broadens your mind. Hola. Rather, it enables you to see more clearly how narrow your oppressors' minds are. Montaigne was no bland multiculturalist. Konnichiwa. He wasn't saying that all cultures are as good as one another. Merhaba. He was just attacking the way that people decide what is good and bad, on the basis of habit rather Hello. than reason. Hello. Hello. With a more global perspective on our behavior, we will grow more accepting, not only of others, but also of aspects of ourselves. We will gain less constraining identities as citizens of the world. Straight the camera, nice big smiles. Three, two, one. It isn't simply others being judgmental which makes us feel inadequate. Another area in which many of us feel we're not up to scratch is the intellectual one. The painful sense that we simply aren't as clever as we should be. This is Gonville and Keyes College, part of Cambridge University. This is a photo of me graduating a few years ago. I had a lot more hair then than I do now. These are supposedly some of the cleverest people in the whole country. I say supposedly because once you start looking at a phenomenon like Cambridge University through Montaigne's eyes, you quickly begin to see things in a rather different way. In Montaigne's day, you needed certain things to be deemed clever. First and foremost, a university degree. For the honor of the college. But however much our society, and Montaigne's own, associates intelligence with academic qualifications, Montaigne had some blunt words on the matter. To him it seemed that most university graduates were, despite the gowns and fancy certificates, in his words, just blockheads. That's fine for one. He wasn't being puerile, just insisting that the outward symbols of intelligence are often different from the reality. 
the kind of intelligence that Montaigne was really keen on, he called wisdom. And importantly, he said that one could be wise without ever having gone to a university like this. All that you need in order to be wise, he thought, is a certain humility, modesty, and an acceptance of your intellectual limitations. Wise people don't always need to know everything. They can also accept that many events are out of their control. They accept the limitations as much of their minds as of their bodies. Montaigne knew many people around his chateau who were simple ploughmen with no formal education whatsoever, and long acquaintance with them persuaded him that these people were often far wiser than university graduates. Montaigne certainly didn't think that all learning was useless. He was simply observing that many people who go to university aren't any happier or wiser than those who don't. And from my own experience, I think he may have a point. What Montaigne was essentially telling us is that if you come to a place like this, um, you will get very good at uh, remembering lots of facts, you will pick up a lot of information, but you won't necessarily be able to apply it to your life. And I certainly missed out on many lessons of life here. If I was designing my ideal curriculum, I think I would take a leaf from Montaigne's book and say that actually many of the most important topics aren't covered here and should be. I'm thinking of topics like uh, how to live well and happily with other people, how to confront one's anxieties, how to deal with death, even banal questions or potentially banal questions like how to end a relationship. Um, these are not the kinds of questions that we're encouraged to ask here and in a way perhaps we should be. Coming back has also given me a chance to put some of Montaigne's points to a rather forbidding figure from my past, the master of my old college, Mr. McKendrick. Montaigne has this um, quote in which he says he's looking out of the window of his chateau and he says many of the people that I see ploughing the soil uh, around my chateau are in fact, better, he says, better, happier and wiser uh, than people who I've known in the universities of Paris. Mm -hmm. um, what do you make of that? Well, I know there's a romantic myth of, 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 of peasant job satisfaction, roses around the door, mm. and I think that myth is one of the plagues of our society, that we're all happier when we are poorer and dying at 27 and, and owning nothing and laboring in, the, in, a, in a, a ditch throughout February and so on. I don't buy that. But how about, how about another aspect of the myth, which is that we might be happier uh, if we had studied less? Well, you're trying to tell me that I'd be happy if I did less of what I'm, I do. That's what I do. So I'm extremely sceptical, not to say mocking, of that particular view. Do you think that people who graduate from here end up happier than people who perhaps have never been to university at all? It's difficult to, to answer that with any certainty, but I like to think they do. Um, I like to think that they do look back fondly on their years. And I think the great, great majority look back nostalgically and appreciatively. Montaigne, of course, recognized that some people are cleverer than others. It's just the way that our society identifies them which is wrong. In particular, there's something wrong with the exam system. It rewards the wrong things, learning rather than wisdom. The paper this morning is an examination in wisdom. So what would an examination that Montaigne could approve of be like? How could one test for wisdom rather than its pale shadow, learning? I had a go at designing such a paper, and Mr. McKendrick let me set it to some of his students. Students must answer five of the following questions. Factual accuracy, while desirable, will not overly impress the examiners. You may now start writing. I asked questions like, what should one do when anxious? What is a good parent? How can one tell if one is in love or infatuated? And should one worry what other people think? Most students today are not asked to sit examinations in wisdom, but perhaps they should be. The education system today, rather like the one in 16th century France in Montaigne's time, make some people feel very stupid when they aren't, while making other people feel very clever when perhaps they aren't either. Montaigne didn't want to do away with the distinction between intelligence and stupidity. He simply wanted to adjust the way that we made that distinction. It's quite possible to be able to write a very brilliant essay, to remember lots of facts, to present an argument cogently and not be wise while at the same time one might lack all of these intellectual disciplines and yet be very wise. A 
cheering idea we take away from Montaigne is that academic qualifications are not the sole or even the chief determinants of intelligence. There are ways of being clever that top universities don't recognize, and ways of being stupid. And if that doesn't help us over feelings of intellectual inadequacy provoked by people with impressive degrees, Montaigne had one final tip. We should take a moment to imagine them sitting on the toilet. As he noted, even on the highest throne, we are seated still upon our asses. If we take away one lesson from Montaigne, it's about the dangers of being intellectually arrogant. And Montaigne, when he was writing in his study, had one way of trying to keep his own feet on the ground. He had a set of 57 short inscriptions, told from the classics and the Bible, painted up on the ceiling, so that when he was writing, he could look up and be reminded of some essential truths. Here we have a quote, it says, Have you ever seen a man who thinks he is wise? You have more to hope for from a madman than from him. And over here there's another quote I very much like. It says, Do not be wiser than necessary, but be wise in moderation. Everything is too complicated for men to be able to understand. The happiest life is to be without thought. I am a man, nothing human is foreign to me. The man who thinks he knows does not yet know what knowing is. Why torment yourself with worries that are outside your control? There is nothing certain but uncertainty, nothing more miserable and more proud than man. Montaigne was inviting us not to be humiliated by aspects of ourselves, our bodies, our idiosyncrasies, our lack of formal education. We can fart at dinner, eat pig snouts, and never have read a book, and still be quite fully human. What makes Montaigne different is that his message stems from a man we can trust as a friend and admire as a role model, one of the first and only philosophers with a reassuringly down-to-earth idea of what it is to be a good human being.